Hello, 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 and welcome to another fantastic episode of Anarchy Among Friends Roundtable Discussion. Before we get started, let me remind you first that we are covered by the BIPCOT No Government License, which allows for the reuse and distribution of this podcast by anyone and everyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more about that at BIPCOT.org. That is B-I-P-C-O-T dot O-R-G. We are also protected by Brandenburg v. Ohio, 1969 which ruled that the government cannot punish inflammatory speech unless that speech is, quote, directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. So everything we say here on this podcast is hypothetical. This is episode 93, I I think. Probably. I don't know. We're not professional. Something in the 90s. I don't know. Yeah. And... <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. We're, going, we're we're going down like flight ninety three. That was a bad joke. <laughs> God. Ooh, ooh. Oh. That's... <laughs> Baby, are you a flight in Pennsylvania? Because that would come <laughs> down on you like flight ninety three. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, we're we're most professional podcast ever. Just ignore us. <laughs> <laughs> If you're listening, if you're still listening, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, it looks like it's just Andrew and I tonight. Guys night without our third leg. Yeah. Two, lonely, two lonely balls. Bouncing things back and forth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Most professional podcast ever. Hey, we're talking about strippers again. So I mean Woohoo! We got we gotta have a we gotta have a, a, a little raunchiness. Like would it really be an episode of Anarchy Among Friends without somebody without talking about strip clubs or strippers? I mean, lately it doesn't seem like that. Lately, no. it's like every single episode, <laughs> strippers have to come up. It's... She's Jeez. like, "Oh, let's let's talk politics, 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 weapons, strippers." <laughs> <laughs> like, if you don't have to, if you don't have the freedom to take off your clothes for your own guys, like, I mean, do you really have any freedom? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you can't if you can't bilk a bunch of lonely businessmen out of hundreds of dollars on a regular basis, I mean, are do you own your body? <laughs> well, in this in this case, I think it would be cowboys and oil workers. Yeah. 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 Well, and oil workers tend to actually have more disposable income than businessmen. So. <laughs> True. Uh, All those funny things, you know, like they, if you remember in, in school where they had the, that career booklet where it would go over like the average incomes for all these careers and stuff, you notice it never mentioned like oil field worker or, you know, like roughneck, like that never got mentioned. The fact that they make more money than an anesthesiologist, like that never (laughs) gets brought up because they want to pretend that somehow college is the only way to go and you have to go to some state school and it's like, um, but they make like a lot of money, guys. I uh... <laughs> see. I'm looking through. We got. Let's see. We got. Let's see. We got that article about the strip clubs, and we got another one about blow up dolls, and then we have another one about government agents getting taxpayer funded hand jobs. <sighs> is this is this what our life has become? Yes. Is this yeah. is, this this is what our podcast? Is? Let's 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 get into hand jobs. God. <laughs> All right, Let's... that's the way this podcast has gone in the past like six episodes. We've just oh, uh, we've right. alienated any con- even remotely conservative viewer and have <laughs> nothing but degenerates right now, which I'm fine with. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's 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 all right. I'm not gonna make that joke twice. All right, <laughs> this is out of uh, this is out of Arizona. It's um. Uh, agents with the Department of Homeland Security in Arizona have been, quote, fighting human trafficking by sending federal agents to coerce suspe- suspected victims into paid sex acts. These acts were later used by authorities to justify arresting women who agreed to them, seizing their assets, and telling the press it was these women who were the real predators. Seizing their assets. Yep. <sighs> That's, uh... <laughs> Federal federal agents had at least 17 encounters with, quote, Asian females 
working in massage parlors around Mojave County, Arizona over a five-month period in 2018. Internal ICE documents show these activities had the blessing of agents' supervisors. When it was all over, the year years or the year long operation yielded three misdemeanor charges stemming from a single sexual encounter which authorities interrupted during the raid so it took them a year of using taxpayer money to go to like madame kame's pleasure palace basically mm-hmm. to get handies yeah Hap- before- get happy endings yeah, before they managed <laughs> to get three misdemeanor charges, none of which had anything to do with the actual undercover stuff. All of it had only to do with something that they actually interrupted by doing the raid. Yeah. Um, the Mojave County investigation, dubbed Operation Asian Touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exclusively targeted Asian massage parlors and spas. Police from Bullhead City and Lake Havasu City began the investigation in 2016 after allegedly receiving reports that some employees at these businesses would provide erotic extras along with back and foot rubs. Local cops decided these businesses were likely human trafficking fronts. After learning that all the mas- all the masseuses were Asian women, because that's not even remotely racist or anything at all. Yeah. So Homeland Security, uh, or so Homeland Security Investigations, uh, a division of ICE, got involved in 2018. <sighs> One of the women charged in the operation, uh, Yo Quin Shu, an immigrant from China in her mid 50s, who ran a licensed foot massage business in Bullhead City. Shu's case first came to the attention last fall, uh, which reported that Shu's lawyer was questioning how DHS agents having sex with suspected abuse victims helps protect national security. (laughs) I can see questioning that a little. (laughs) I mean, uh, guys, not not to be an essay or anything, but um, how exactly does actually victimizing the victims help protect us from terrorists? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Quote, it is unclear how how an ICE officer having sexual relations with human trafficking victims in Mojave County, Arizona, protects the nation from terrorist attacks or secures its borders. That is uh, attorney Brad Reinout. He's a um, an emotion seeking the real names of the undercover agents who were identified in police documents only as Arturo and Sergio. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> well, what did they like? Go. Oh, what do we call them? Um, hey, somebody grab that romance novel. The first two male names that we find in it, we're gonna use those. Uh, just <laughs> it's. If you didn't know this was real, this sounds like complete parody. Like, yeah. <laughs> if if you track initial claims about massage parlor based human trafficking through their actual conclusions, you'll find, or you'll almost always find, law enforcement simply targeting sex workers, small business owners, immigrants, and people who patronize them with harassment, assault, arrest, property seizure, prosecution, detainment, and deportation. All the quote victims they allegedly set out to save frequently wind up facing criminal charges. Because that's helpful. Oh gosh, are you locked up most of the time and forced to do sex work? Let me go ahead and throw you into lockup where you're probably going to be raped statistically. Like, (laughs) See, we saved you. All I can think of is the Spongebob and Patrick meme. With the, the, the entire town burning behind them. We did it, Patrick. We saved the city. Good yeah. God. An, an HSI memo, that is home, Homeland Security Investigation, on the Mojave County investigation described incidents after incidents of an undercover federal agent telling Amos Seuss, quote, to masturbate him. It includes accounts like, quote, the female placed oil on her hand and began to stroke the UC's penis. After a few minutes, the female stopped and gave the UC a towel to clean himself. Or, quote, quote, she masturbated the UC until he told her he was done. 
In several incidences, ICE agents paid extra for masseuses to strip naked or go topless while jerking them off. That totally doesn't sound like entrapment to me at all. Yeah, not at all. No. Not even remotely. Like, they're totally just regular massage workers. And like, hey, I'll give you an extra $500 to jack me off. Like, that's not entrapment. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> After a few months of ICE agents trying to finagle sex from women they described as likely victims of human trafficking, federal and local law enforcement made a big to-do about their, quote, rescue work. In September 2018, article headline touting, quote, eight arrested in human trafficking investigation. The Arizona Republic noted that ICE officials, quote, held a joint press conf- press conference with Lake Havasu City and Bullhead City Police Departments about the extensive undercover operation that led to the arrests. Police told the press that Shu was suspected uh, of a range of horrible offenses. This including trafficking persons of for-, for forced labor, unlawfully obtaining labor, procuring people for a house of prostitution, and sex trafficking. But the next day when she was charged, none of the severest offenses were part of the indictment. Yeah, because they didn't want the fact that they had all been entrapping everybody, and they didn't want to... Apparently, as far as I can tell, they didn't want to actually like charge any of the people who actually performed the illegal acts. Yeah. So, probably because they <laughs> wanted to be able to go back to them. I... <laughs> no, she's a really nice girl. She says she likes me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, ultimately, Shu was charged with money laundering in the first degree and operating a house of prostitution, both felonies, for allegedly, for allegedly agreeing to sexual activity with ICE agents. The affidavit got a warrant for Shu's arrest that, quote, an undercover agent with the Homeland Security Investigation Team went to Shu's house on three separate occasions and, pre- and paid Shu to perform sex acts for him. So not even at the <sighs> business, at her house. No, at her house, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, um, uh, as a result, uh, so I'm reading down the article. As a result, December, December 2019, prosecutors dismissed all charges – the, from the pair whom authorities had initially described as the heads of a transnational criminal organization. Uh huh. Either the description, uh, and the article says, either the description was just a spin all along, or DHS is willing to let evildoers go free rather than answer questions about its policy of agents getting off on sex trafficking. Yeah. Well, a, this is uh, hold, hold, hold on. A few weeks later, on December 30th, the uh, the charges against Shu and another woman who had been charged with prostitution were dropped. Ultimately, the operation that consumed years of police, court, and federal agency time landed just three state misdemeanor convictions, all stemming from a single, a single incident of sexual activity for pay. A 45 year old woman who was convicted of prostitution landing her 56 days in jail and a $600 fine. While the man who paid her was convicted of solicitation. So it wasn't even an agent. Nope. This is just a dude. Yep. (laughs) Her agent, or or, I'm sorry, her husband, who drove her to the massage parlor where this took place, accepted a plea deal of one charge of attempted pandering. I just... (laughs) I boggles the mind. You know, okay. So this t- this so this was 2016. Um, arrests were 2018. Charges were dropped in December, right? So this is this is a three year investigation. They <laughs> they had 17 sexual encounters with the women at the massage parlor, and all that they got was 56 days in jail and a $600 fine. And they probably spent millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. I mean, and not only were they spending millions of dollars, but you had a bunch of agents who were probably exclusively working on this. Which means that they are, I mean, essentially what's happening is they are paying these guys millions of dollars to just go get massages with happy endings regularly. And... 
for effectively nothing at all, but charging two people, well, three people with victimless crimes. Hold on, hold on. It gets even better. It gets even better. It gets even better. Uh, HSI Deputy Special Agent in Charge Lon Wingen said in a press conference that $128,000 in cash and $30,000 worth of gold coins and jewelry were seized during the operation. That's according, what it was about. According to the Arizona Statement, the ASU, Arizona Statements, Statements Union, whatever it is, the Arizona Paper Report, most of this, $105,120, has not been and will not be returned, despite most of the cases being dismissed. It was, so they, so they spent three years and three, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars to get... In, to get 56 days in jail and a $600 fine and $105,000 or $105,120 100, $105, that they just stole. That they just stole. Yeah. So. <laughs> and seven and 17 sexual acts. And they, if these, if these girls were in fact sex trafficking victims and that's, you know, completely unprovable and unknowable if they were they didn't save a single one of them and all they managed no. to do was <laughs> repeatedly victimize them further yes and if they weren't sex trafficking victims and were actual legit like massage therapists they simply entrapped and victimized a bunch <laughs> of women yeah. so that they could steal money <laughs> from them <laughs> well, on the ta on the taxpayer dime. You don't you can't we can't forget about that. On yeah. the taxpayer dime. Yeah, and the people the people of the United States are paying for this. <laughs> it's fucking... I but without <laughs> government, who would force Chinese women to give them hand jobs so that they could steal gold from the person who runs their, their place of employment? And then th like... and then throw them in jail for it. Yeah, and then throw them in jail. What that is, this is your government, ladies and gentlemen. What, what is that? What's that? I think it's a Harry Brown saying that says, uh, um, government or government is good at two things uh, something, something, something like breaking your leg and handing you a crutch and saying, here, without us, you wouldn't be able to walk. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, bu I butchered, I butchered that quote. Sorry, but, but it, it's close enough. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what it is. It's just, it blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the colossal waste of time that it was even ignoring that it's over victimless crimes because realistically, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say this is an average Joe who goes and he goes to this massage parlor and he goes, Hey, look, I'm single and lonely and I will pay you an extra hundred dollars to jack me off. Yep. And then she goes, all right, fine. And then does it. He pays her a hundred. Who's victimized in that scenario? Absolutely no one. There is no actual victim here at all. <laughs> all right. This is, this is, this is the icing on the cake. And it, at, <laughs> at the 2018 press conference, Lake Havasu city police chief, Dan Doyle <laughs> crowed that his investigation is, Quote, a great example of see something, say something. What? Yes. What? Lake what? Avasu City Police Chief Dan Doyle crowed that his investigation is a great example of see something, say something. What? These people, I mean, how, uh, is that, how is that not Orwellian double speak like hell? Well, you remember that, that was the, the DHS slogan. I know right. that was that it... was the that was the the we are that was that was the previous we are all in this together. Yeah, I know. See something, say something, <laughs> so. Yes. What they they saw an attractive Chinese woman and decided to say, "Hey, I'll give you extra money <laughs> to get me off." What the hell are they? What? What? <laughs> it, I just, ignore I'm, the man behind the curtain. I'm speechless. I should, like. Just... I, I was I was speechless when I first read that article, and saying it and repeating it out loud. I mean, I'm just it <sighs> just what <laughs> like 
see they saw they saw terrorists in action they're these horrifying these horrifying little asian women who are giving people massages with happy endings it was just the horror so they had to be stopped and by stopped i mean not stopped in any way shape or form and simply robbed well <laughs> they had to be paid yeah they were paid and then they robbed not even the girls who they entrapped they paid them they robbed a businesswoman who was just running a massage parlor who they convinced to let them come to her house unrelated to the business And also, I want to point out, that woman was how old? Like, in her 50s? 54. So these dudes paid a... F- <laughs> paid a nearing retirement age Chinese woman. For a handy. For a handy at her house. And then... On the, ta- it. on the taxpayer dime. Yeah. So the taxpayers paid for them to get a handy from a near... From a pensioner Chinese woman... At her home, and they touted that as a great win for national security. God, this should just what should, planet they, do these people? And the worst part is they believe it. Like well, they they're ab- not. They absolutely believe that they did the right thing. Yeah, they don't see the absurdity. Like they actually think. Like if you talk to these people, they actually think that what they're doing is a valuable service, and actually believe this is a win. Like they're not just saying this to put spin on it, knowing that it's just spin. They actually believe this crap, <laughs> which is, which is scary. That is the scariest part. But. Like, and then people wonder how it is that these SS people could, you know, and the Einstadts could do such horrible things during the Holocaust and then <laughs> just go, well, I was just doing my job. This right here, this right here is how, because they have convinced themselves that it doesn't matter how stupid and ridiculous and useless yeah. that the things that they do are because it's them. It must be helpful. The law is the law. They have to justify their own existence. Yeah, exactly. Oh. All right, let's let's. Jesus. All right, let's lighten up a little bit. Um, <laughs> let's let's talk about social distancing. All right, South Carolina restaurant. <laughs> All right, hold on. I need to calm down. <laughs> so, I have the image of the picture for this article in my head, and it's one of the fucking funniest things I've ever seen. South Carolina restaurant uses blow-up dolls to enforce social distancing between tables. <laughs> oh, this is uh, Taylor's South Carolina. It says, as businesses, as businesses across the country begin to reopen, they're learning to adapt when it comes to social distancing. For one restaurant in South Carolina, that means blow-up dolls. Yes, really. According to Fox Carolina, the owner of Open, Her- Open Hearth wanted to keep her customers separated, but they didn't like the idea of blocking off their tables with unsightly tape. Quote, I dread putting the yellow tape across booths and making everybody think that this is a condemned restaurant or that things are in bad shape. Paula Starr told the station. <laughs> yes, because blow-up dolls are much more reasonable. She, she and her employees brainstormed how to avoid caution tape and turned to the internet for ideas. Oh, Inspiration <laughs> soon struck in the form of blow-up dolls. Where did they turn, 4chan? <laughs> uh, <laughs> quote, they had no obscene body parts or anything like that. We found five men and five women that we decided to dress up with our own clothes and blow them up. <laughs> As customers return, uh, returned, many appeared amused by the unusual plan. Quote, golly, just having some customers that don't talk too much. We love the idea. One patron <laughs> laughed. <laughs> I don't know about that couple over the other booth. Why? Look at them. They both look really shocked. <laughs> she said she's glad to see customers enjoying themselves as they attempt a return to normalcy. Quote, I appreciate the local people that have helped us, helped us, helped us out to give us a little bit of a punch to our day and make us feel like we created something that has a little more fun and light uh, than the foreboding pandemic. Yeah, the the image 
the pictures that they use is they got blow up doll and they got them like in the worst clothing and they have wigs on and they have hats on and <laughs> the, the blow up dolls got these just weird bugged out looking eyes and it somewhere is, it is creepy somewhere there is a neck bearded weeb who is so excited to go to that restaurant <laughs> Oh, uh, I, with, and of course, the the, art, the article Andrew has not one but two ads for for masks for, for useless face masks. Yeah, uh, Jesus, <sighs> just I mean, I <laughs> the new normal. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure somewhere in Japan, this is just an everyday thing for a restaurant <laughs> just, or I, South Korea. Uh, those I just, those blow up dolls might have a little more anatomicalness to them. I know, but it just oh my god, like it's just. Uh, I just I I I'm a bad person, and and I kind of hope one of the dolls deflates, and there's some girl there trying to blow up the doll in the middle of the restaurant, <laughs> just for. Just, just for the laugh of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just, it's the. I mean, what? It's, it, <sighs> it's, it's a dumb little article, but it was it. It's a good laugh. I'm sorry. You, because you literally, you, you could have just put little signs on the tables in between, huh? just saying like, due to Re- social distancing, remove half confused. the tables. Yeah, you undo like probably like eight bolts, and the the booth tables come out, and uh, you know you just stick them in the back somewhere, and there. And there aren't tables there. Or, I mean, again, even easier, you just put a sign there. That's it. But no, no, no. Blow up dolls. <laughs> like, that's, oh, I mean, I'm just picturing some dude walking going, oh, my God, Candy, I didn't expect to see you here. Like, <laughs> and who is this? <laughs> There's somebody going to try and look up that doll skirt. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, let's let's get on let's let's get on to this this article that we we I think you and I both want to talk about this one because just the the phrase the phrase that is used in the title it needs to be a patch or a shirt and if you steal that idea Andrew and I get fifteen percent. Yep. All right. Uh, Michigan coronavirus pro. Okay, this is a, a Marcy Bianco. Uh, it's an op-ed written on NBC, um, and it's a Michigan coronavirus protester shout liberty as right-wing rhetoric weaponizes freedom. I really, really need a T-shirt or patch that says <sighs> weaponize weaponizes freedom. freedom. <laughs> yeah. What might happen if we were to understand liberty as a type of freedom? That holds us accountable for the welfare of all Americans. What kind of collectivist? I. All right, I'm, I'm gonna read that. Okay. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Yeah. Obedience. Yeah. <laughs> what might happen if we were to understand liberty as a type of freedom that holds us accountable for the welfare of all Americans. Do these people understand what any of the words they're using actually mean at all? Or are they intentionally just trying to obfuscate the actual definitions of oh, every it's, word they're oh, using? Oh, it's absolutely obfuscation. It is absolutely, it's Overton window. I just, what? Like, all animals are equal. Some are more equal than <laughs> others. Like, what is, oh, okay. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm going to try to get through this. Okay. What is the difference between liberty and freedom in the eyes of many Americans? Absolutely nothing. And therein lies the problem driving the culture war around coronavirus's shelter-in-place orders, but also arguably the crux of, a f- crux of all fronts of America's culture wars, from guns to religion to speech, and now it seems haircuts. Well, I... <sighs> yeah. It is it is a slippage skillfully leveraged by co- by conservatives. What? 
Yeah. <laughs> this week in Michigan, armed protesters are heeding the call, but the petulant rally cries echo across the United States. Petulant. 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 Yeah. She used the uh-huh. word petulant. All right. Uh, quote, give me liberty or give me death. So goes the universal whine lifted from Patrick Henry's Virginia Con- Virginia Convention speech in 1775. Wine? W H I N E. Wine. Wine. Leaving aside the obvious reply. What is the obvious reply? I don't know. What? Leave- I... Yeah. Leaving aside the obvious reply, there is a greater and certainly more delicious irony in the protesters' call for liberty, and that inspires me too. Reach for another popular quote from American culture. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Hashtag irony. (laughs) Good God. Because, my fellow Americans, liberty does not mean what you think it means. Liberty is a type of freedom defined and limited by civil society. It is not an unrestrained, unchecked license to do whatever one desires. Rather, liberty is a right constituted by the society and he or here nation one lives in. This is perhaps what is best for everyone in name of liberty. Yes. Yes. (laughs) This is perhaps why one of the founding documents of this nation, the Declaration of Independence, fucking ads pop up. They're perhaps. This is perhaps why one of the founding documents of this nation, the De- the Declaration of Independence, does not once mention the word freedom, but instead champions the, quote, inalienable rights of, quote, liberty or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, the preamble of the Constitution, too, mentions liberty only in the context of forming a more perfect union. And yet, as the quarantine protests make clear, a popular yet factually and legally inaccurate sentiment has infected the minds of many Americans. To paraphrase, it goes something like this. Quote, this is America and I am free to do whatever I want. What but, drugs hold on, hold is on, this person hold, on? Hold on. Right <laughs> but actually, no, you can't. Americans must abide by laws, regulations, and codes from their town's garbage collection rules to the federal law (laughs) declaring that 18 is a legal voting age. The general, indeed patriotic, spirit is collectively, as Americans who will follow these laws to promote and ensure the, quote, general welfare of of the people, all people of the United States. (laughs) This lady... Is I, fucking insane. How many head injuries did she sustain in her youth? Like, I, well, how I, many no, drugs? This is, this is, this is blatant collectivism. Like, I, 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 I use that the the analogy all the time that a lot of people, both conservatives, both on, on the left and on the right, and libertarians, even anarchists, even they use. Or they they see freedom, they see liberty, they see the Constitution, they see the law, as an a la carte menu, right? It's a fast food menu. It's it's McFreedoms, and they pull up to McFreedoms, and they'll say, "I'll take a Second Amendment, but remove this, remove that," or oh, I'll yeah. take a fir- I'll take a First Amendment, but add that and take away this. Can I get a uh, Bill of Rights? Hold the uh, Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment. And uh, maybe, you know, also restrict or uh, remove. Uh, can I get uh, no um, anti presidential uh, arguments uh, off of the uh, the First Amendment? And um, oh, would you like some spies with that? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just like what? Yeah, this 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 is the, the, the paragraph that really got me here. <sighs> Well, it's, it's, well, two paragraphs. It's a paragraph and a half. Okay, without a doubt, the tensions between liberty and freedom reside at the very foundation of this nation. It is a tension that, over time, has widened into an incredible and increasing partisan chasm between, quote, the good of the people and, quote, the good of the person. Oh, hold up. 
the belief that personal freedom is more valuable than the common good factors heavily in right wing right wing logic, and it has, particularly in the twenty first century, been the strategic linchpin of right wing efforts to squash social and economic justice movements, particularly through race baiting, xenophobic rhetoric. Such rhetoric is such rhetoric which we are starting to see creep into anti quarantine protests is designed to stroke fear of oppression in white American society. So, sh- on race baiting, it's all about white freedom. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, hold on. Okay, holy uh, shit. It is not simply our understanding of liberty that is lacking. The rhetoric of freedom, as it is specifically an American understanding, is code for ethical clair- or ethical carelessness, as well as political and social dominance. Freedom functions as the inevitably or in the, the invincibility shield of white supremacists who shout it like fire in a theater. And like the chaos of a fire, it is tactically deployed by Republican and and conservative leaders to incite civil unrest and the public's distrust of government. This is, and I don't use this term lightly, actually word salad. This is, uh, this is some industrial word salad. I'm going to, I'm going to read that paragraph again. Just, (sighs) it is not simply our understanding of Liberty that is lacking the rhetoric of freedom and it is very specifically an American understanding, is code for ethical carelessness as well as political and social dominance. Freedom functions as the invincibility shield of white supremacists who shout it like fire in a theater. And like the chaos of a fire, it is tactically deployed by Republican and conservative leaders to incite civil unrest and the public's distrust of government. Wow. At no time during that answer (laughs) were you anywhere approaching something that was correct. In fact, we are all dumb. Or dumber for having (laughs) heard that. Absolutely dumber for having I therefore award you no points for that answer. And may God have mercy on your soul. (laughs) Just... I mean, that's what this is. This actually is, because remember, that was that was in response to a business ethics thing where he just had this huge word salad that for the business for what business ethics meant. That's exactly what like what like I just. uh, I can't I don't have words for how insane this is. Oh, it is. It, it, the art the article just gets or the 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 op-ed piece just gets worse and worse and worse and, we're, and she cites another article from the Atlantic written by a historian um and whoop, and uh, she goes on to say that the traces the rage of these protesters to what he calls quote the slaveholders psyche the psyche is a mentality even a way of living represented by the fine yet significant distinction between freedom to and freedom from, he explained. This is not simply a difference in preposition. It is one of power and is one is one of power and privilege. There is a stunning difference between the freedom to enslave and the freedom from enslavement. Race baiting. Oh, it's freedom, all about race baiting. Slavery. Freedom, the supremacy. freedom to inflict and the freedom from infection. Some Americans want to live in a society that frees them from, as individuals, by subjugating the community. This Ooh. was the psyche of slaveholders who believed he was free only if the community was enslaved. What? No. What? And that, I, isn't it ironic that they this, want to bring up slavery when, that when the, that's... That, this is the, the exact opposite of the let us go to work mentality. Yeah, it isn't it isn't about oh I have I have the freedom to it's I have a freedom from you stopping me from working. You have a freedom to 
avoid going out into public. You have the freedom to avoid risking infection. That is your freedom. But I have the freedom to go to to work. To tell you to fuck off. Yeah, and not care about your risk factors because that's not my fucking problem. And there's... There's an angle to this, to the, to this article, and it's, it's, I, the person that wrote it is really, really missing this because I, it, it's a mentality thing. But, um, you and I, we want to be free from the oppression of government. We want to be free from the coercion of outside forces, right? I mean, that's that that that's our end goal, right? We want to we want to be free to. Like, not necessarily free to do whatever we want, but that's just a byproduct of being free from the oppression. The This person and, and the, per, the people that they cited in the article, they look at government not as the oppressor, but as the tool used to present them with liberty. And there's, there's a huge difference there because you the, the government cannot exist without, without oppressing people. Well, right. That's its entire right. job. That, that's the entire job. Yeah. This person is under the impression that that government can exist in a in such a way that gives people freedom. Ignoring, of course, that like with the slaveholder mentality thing, that slavery was enforced by law, enforced uh-huh. by government responsibility, mm-hmm. and was in fact argued for as a social responsibility that slavery, like if you actually look at um, a lot of the rhetoric that was used, especially by um, Southern fire eaters uh, like uh, Calhoun uh, in the antebellum U S a lot of the rhetoric that they used talked about how you had a social responsibility to quote, Keep the Negro enslaved, end quote, because if you didn't, then it was going to allow chaos because everyone would just be free, especially the the former slaves would be free to just do anything they wanted and it would just cause societal chaos. This is exactly the same arguments that the left, the political left Democrats have been using since then, because Calhoun, mm-hmm. don't forget, was a Democrat, right? Yeah. The, the South. The ones who the states had seceded were Democrats. And it's hyper ironic that this lady believes all of the Democrat rhetoric, which and and is again, I mean, this uh, is word salad. This is at, basically a collection of meaningless sentences. Yeah. At, at, at the bottom of the article, it gives a little bio on her and it says her writings can be found online. Her writings can be found online. Um, NBC Think, Pacific Standard, Quartz, Rolling Stone, um, Salon, Vanity Fair and Vox. Oh boy! Yeah. So yeah. But, um, the last the last paragraph of this of of this piece that she wrote. I'm, I'm gonna stop calling her articles. It's not it's not an article. It's a it's an op ed. But this piece she wrote. It says um, instead of indiscriminately crying freedom or liberty to defend one assumed right to offend or harm, what might happen if we were to understand liberty as a freedom existing and expressed alongside the freedom of all Americans. Liberty as a type of freedom that holds us accountable for the welfare of the nation and all its people. Might we then form a more perfect union? Isn't she like changing the definitions of words that she's using halfway through sentences repeatedly? How how could you have freedom and hold everyone accountable for the welfare of a nation and its people? You can't have welfare or liberty and hold everyone accountable because you can't hold everyone accountable without oppressing. So, well, and she also mentions freedom to offend. Because I, again, that's, I'm, I think that I think that that's just rhetoric, man. That's like, but I mean, that's it's, but, it's, but it's, it's important. It's rhetoric. division. It's it's very important. It's propaganda. It's very, it's very propaganda. She keeps parrying it, parrot, parroting it, and says it again and again and again in different forms. And it's really propagandizing the right and trying to make the right look like, well, like slave masters. Well, right. Which is ironic since again, all the slave masters were in fact on the political left. Um, 
<laughs> the, but I mean, that's my point. Like, it's it's ironic that she quotes one. It's ironic that she quotes uh, the Declaration of Independence because, again, the Declaration of Independence is written while slavery exists, and slavery would continue to exist for over eighty years after that in the mm-hmm. U.S. Yep, and don't forget that the uh, Emancipation Proclamation uh, did not free the slaves in the northern states. The North still had slavery for another three years. It didn't even actually free the slaves in all of the southern states because it only freed slaves in southern states that were presently in rebellion. And so, like, the slaves in Kentucky were still slaves in Kentucky. The slaves in West Virginia were still slaves in West Virginia. Yeah. Because they weren't states that had seceded. They were rebellious state, and whether or not West Virginia actually existed at the time, and yeah, but it, it, the point is, like, at least Kentucky, right? Like, we can at least address Kentucky because Kentucky hadn't yeah. seceded, it still had slaves, and the Emancipation Proclamation did not emancipate slaves in Kentucky. It made it a point not to. That's why Lincoln phrased it the way that he did, was because he was worried that if he didn't phrase it that way and, and make it about um, confiscating uh, war goods. Right. Because the argument behind it was that uh, slaves were being property were property that was being used. So, again, this is still endorsing (laughs) slavery. It's tacitly still endorsing slavery. Uh, Tell people tell people what you have a a degree in before you go further. uh, Military history. There you go. So um, the the, I I have I have a BS (laughs) in (laughs) in in uh, in military history. So but. The it's tacitly endorsing slavery because it's saying that the slaves are, in fact, property. It's not outright yeah. saying it, but that's the implication, because the justification behind it was and, and it takes a lot of in-depth study. And there's uh, if you ever listen to uh, the Civil War podcast um, with Rich and Tracy, it's it's really, really good. And, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, but they bring that up, too, and, and in a way more in-depth way. But basically, the point is that they uh the Emancipation Proclamation is coming from a standpoint that uh, the uh, slaves are property, which are being used in the course of rebellion against the United States, and as such, fall under war goods and can therefore be confiscated by the federal government uh, to prevent their use in rebellion. So that's the idea. It's the same thing as if you were going to confiscate guns from somebody who was in a slave state who was fighting against the Union. It's it was viewed exactly the same way. And the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to deal with that because the problem that they were running into is that you had a lot of these generals who were confiscating slaves under under war powers and and saying, well, I get to do this because they're, it's material that's being used for a fight against me. And then the question became, OK, but what do we do with them? Uh, so, because like, if I confiscate them, well, I don't want to leave them behind. I have to bring them with me. But if I bring them back to union lines into free areas, like, are they still slaves? And and is that fair? And, you know, so it got, it got complicated. So that was the idea, but it's still tacitly acknowledging them as property. And the left will, will tout the Emancipation Proclamation the same as the right will, ignoring the fact that Lincoln was, in fact, a Republican. Uh, and that they, all the people against him were, in fact, Democrats. Um, but, you know, it's that whole myth of the party flip thing, which drives me insane. Yeah. And, but the, the, the irony is that she's quoting these documents that are written while people were considered property. And then she's also going, oh, it's all about race baiting by saying freedom and liberty, which is yeah. ironic because then she immediately <laughs> race baits like hell and saying, well, you don't have freedom and then race baits um, and tries to make it instead of about. And the funny thing is, like Patrick Henry, when he said, give me liberty or give me death, he said me. He didn't say mm-hmm. us. He yeah, didn't say give society if me personally. Yeah. Freedom yeah, if, or kill me personally. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the individual is the, is, the, is the smallest minority. Well, yeah, and to say, oh, well, it's not about you, it's about society. Okay, well, which members of society then? Because society is made up of individuals. And what's going to mm-hmm. happen is if I say, well, what members of society? You're going to say, well, this individual and that individual and this person and that. So now, again, you're going back to individuals. Mm-hmm. You cannot escape yeah, the concept. 
that's, of that's, individual freedom. That's that's exactly what the in this last paragraph is actually what she said. She said, um, um, what if we understood liberty as a type of freedom that holds us accountable for the welfare of a nation and its people? A nation is a nebulous kind of welfare of a nation. If you want to argue that Hitler argued the same fucking thing in mm-hmm. the 1930s in Germany. It's about the welfare of Germany and the German people. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the same and rhetoric that tyrant he, after tyrant after tyrant uses. He was a socialist. Just saying. Yeah. And he was he was very definitely in the political left. In fact, if you read uh, I brought up on the podcast before, but I know we've gotten a lot of new listeners in the past, like 30 episodes since last time I brought it up. But <laughs> um, if you read Mein Kampf, which I've done because obviously I studied again, military history, I specialized in the Civil War and World War Two. Um, if you read Mein Kampf, he's going, yes, we're socialists. But our socialism is different than (laughs) Russian socialism because our socialism isn't a global socialism. It's a national socialism. It's just about us, the Germans, our people, and not about those other people. Which is also why when people talk about the the alt-right being Nazis, I can't really argue with them. Because they agree with what Hitler's <laughs> ideas were, was that, oh, well, it's okay for socialism as long as it's taking care of a specific nation and group of people. And it's it boggles my mind that this article is like trying to argue all of the same things that Hitler himself would have argued. I mean, it is blatantly yeah. the same it's things abso- that Hitler would have argued. It's absolutely <laughs> arguing collectivism as a form of individual liberty. Yeah, the again, it's the the war is peace, freedom is slavery. <laughs> o, is it obedience is freedom? Something like that. That's, yeah, that's exactly it. It's the this idea that somehow by being collectively held accountable for everyone's actions, you're more free, and that's just not the case. That is antithetical to freedom and antithetical to the ideas. That the founding fathers, who she likes to keep bringing up, <laughs> believed. And that's actually the the one book that I have. I love this book, and I got it for really cheap, and it would be super expensive if you wanted to get it um, now, because I managed to get it for 40 bucks, and it's normally about $100. Um, it's for the defense of themselves and the state, the original intent and judicial interpretation of the right to keep and bear arms by Clayton E. Kramer. It's a really, really good book. I don't know if it's in print anymore. It's absolutely awesome, and if if you believe in the right to keep and bear arms, it is it is worth reading. Um, it's heavy reading though, and heavy like it quotes a lot from the founding fathers. Um, a those, lot. And those dudes had some um, heavy had some heavy writing. Yeah, and it's and it goes into it goes into a lot of uh, early jurisprudence and and things, but. It's one of the things that it brings up that's really, really important, and it brings it up consistently, is that the founding fathers believed that everyone had a responsibility collectively to protect that which they valued. Now, it's not to take, you know, to not hurt anyone else in the society or anything. It was if you value something, you have a responsibility to protect it is the theme you so it but but it's your responsibility personally and therefore you personally have the freedom to have the means with which to defend the things that you value yeah and that's that's what the opposite of what she did in this article she collectivized individual morality she collectivized individual liberty she tried to collectivize individual responsibility and it's a bait and switch it's a logical absolutely, bait and absolutely. switch where they that's what i was saying with her changing definitions part way through sentences is that she initially says something about like individual freedom and then still uses the same terms but now magically they mean something else at the end of the sentence and it's and you'll see that constantly in the collectivist rhetoric yeah. and constantly in the status thing where they use that they love to take and especially lately because the themes of freedom and liberty 
are and personal responsibility that phrase personal responsibility they love to try and mutate the word though what those words mean in order to be able to make their arguments more palatable because those themes are getting so big now where people are bringing them up all the time and they know they can't say no you shouldn't be free so instead they have to co-opt the phrase freedom <laughs> to mean not well, yeah, freedom. That, um, I, I, I don't know the, 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 the word or, or who did it, but um, one of the things that when, when the, the U.S. government, uh, what they did to the Native Americans, like one of the first things they did to truly conquer the Native Americans was they tried to kill the Native American culture. They tried to kill the language. Right, and when you mm -hmm. can kill, when you can kill a language, when you can kill a, a, a people's language, you can kill their culture, right? They, 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 they sep they separated the, the kids from their parents, sent the kids to freaking to boarding schools, to Catholic boarding schools where they were beaten and and what had their hand had their mouths washed out with soap and 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 all this other just absolutely terrible things when they spoke their native language. Oh yeah, and that still that still per has has repercussions now because like Lindsay went to you know she went to high school on on the reservation, and she she's talked about the fact that like basically no one but the oldest elders could even even uh -huh. in her language classes no yeah. one but the oldest elders could even teach the Ojibwe yeah. language to the younger generations because no one spoke it. And that meant that even the adults who had gone through the same classes years prior still hadn't become fluent enough. We see the same thing in Ireland. Yeah, in Ireland, absolutely. where the, the British mm -hmm. banned the speaking of Gaelic mm -hmm. in, uh, in public. And so only very rural communities largely could still speak it and still can speak it. And they're still fighting uh, more than 100 years after the, the Prolock and the Aryan. Um, and only really only maybe 70 years after actual independence sort of independence was achieved, they're still fighting to try and bring back the Irish language. I mean, you, there are play, you know, they have all their signs and all of the, uh, the political offices are still Ashkelga. They're, they're in, in Irish. Um, but outside of those, the, what those mean, no one can speak it still. Because we went through 700 years of not <laughs> being able to speak it at all. And that has a serious effect. You know, people say you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. Except you can kill an idea if you can eliminate the words to make the idea happen. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what that piece is about. It's, it's a culture killer. That, that's what it's trying to do. When, when, you, when you change the words... Or when you change the the meaning of words, you, when you pervert those the those meanings, you know you change the way the words are used, and you change the way that people use them. You change the the culture surrounding that word. Like freedom, freedom in 1775 does not have the same meaning it does in 2020. Exactly, absolutely, it doesn't. It it completely doesn't. I mean, it's like like the phrase in the Second Amendment, one of the amendments that I'm most <laughs> passionate about defending. Um, Sh Shall not be infringed. Well, shall not be infringed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that one apparently means be infringed constantly. Uh, but no, the, the phrase, um, the, the, the phrase, a well-regulated militia, militia. Yeah. In 18th century parlance, well-regulated meant properly maintained and supplied. It didn't mean like restricted. It meant exactly the opposite. Yeah. It meant fully, a fully capable of doing what it needed to do. And because that phrase has been co-opted and mutated and changed. So has, so has the word militia. Yeah. The word militia has changed the, there's that famous phrase, you know, well, what is the militia? Is it not the whole of the people? I don't remember if that yeah. was Jefferson. I want to say it was Jefferson. Um, Sounds right. Yeah. Uh, that, and it's, it might've been Madison actually might've been Madison. Um, but the, that phrase, you know, is in, it, that idea that, <sighs> You can change, and that's an important thing that that idea that you can change the mm. entire mindset around one phrase that has existed unchanged for almost 300 years. You can still alter what it means by mutating the meanings of the words, and therefore now it's completely different. And it's 
I've talked about it before, but it's, you know, it's like trying to explain, imagine trying to explain to a bird that has seen nothing but cages its entire life. Mm -hmm. What flying over the mountains is it, Mm -hmm. it does not have explaining the ocean to a goldfish. Yeah. It doesn't actually have words like the words that you're going to use. It Mm -hmm. cannot, there's no, it, it conjures no thought because mm-hmm. it has no basis for the meaning of those words. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same thing. That's how you kill ideas. Yeah, it's, uh, to, to, to dumb it down, to simplify it, to Jasonify it, right? Fire is hot, right? Well, you don't know what hot is if you've never experienced hot. Right? I mean, that's as, that's as Jason fight as I can say. It. Explain the color blue to a blind person since birth. Yeah. Like, how do you explain the color? Oh, it's the color of the sky. It's the color of a, an open ocean. It's the color... Well, okay, that tells me nothing. <laughs> I if I have no basis to understand what those look like, yeah. then I can't I can't process your description. So it's the same it's the same idea. It's you if I can take away the ideas that these words are meant to conjure mm-hmm. and replace them with something far more nefarious, now yeah, those absolutely. words have altered mm-hmm. their meanings. And when you think of those things, your the idea may still exist verbatim, but it means something completely different. So I've killed the original idea. So don't yeah, think when, that you can't kill an idea because you absolutely mm-hmm. can. Yeah. Like I just said, when, when you when you when you change the words, you change the culture. Right. So they they that article attempted to collectivize the words freedom and liberty. Just, uh, come on you guys but it's i mean that's something that's already happened from the political right too that's the the it's not like the left the we, has the we, the we the people tattoos yeah it's not like the 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 left has exclusive claim on having tried to collectivize the ideas <laughs> no, of freedom and not. liberty it's oh. you know like the the i'm proud to live you know like think of the song you know i'm proud to live in america or at least i know i'm free well what but (laughs) what does that mean just because you're in america means you're free automatically america is synonymous with free you see that with the flag when you bring up that the flag you know how ironic it is that so many of these protesters are waving american flags the american flag flew over slavery way 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 longer than the confederate flag yeah the confederate flag flew over slavery Actually, the Confederate flag that you usually see fly never flew over slavery, yeah. flew no. over the <laughs> Army of the Tennessee, uh, actually. Um, not even the Army of Northern Virginia, fun fact, which was the main army of uh, the Confederacy. The Army of the Tennessee is, in fact, who that battle flag belonged to. Um, but the the flag of the Confederacy, if anyone ever actually bothered to fly it, and they don't, um, in fact... Uh, flew over in its final iteration flew over slavery for like a year yeah <laughs> the flag of the united states flew over slavery for like 89 years slavery and its traditional form yes because i would still argue taxation and slavery yeah ra- race-based slavery let's let's yeah. put it that way race-based yeah. slavery it flew over for well, 89 can even, years can you even say that with intention of servitude yeah, and, yeah, it's and, true. And, and, the, and the Irish and yeah, but indentured servitude had stopped existing by the time the U.S. was founded, like at least within the American colonies. It still existed right, in okay. Barbados, but it, it it didn't really. And should you, speaking of books, as long as I'm making <laughs> book recommendations, should you want to know more about Irish slavery in the New World, I highly recommend "To Hell or Barbados" by uh, Sean O'Callaghan. Um, he's, he's gone now and it's a loss to the world. Um, but basically this book covers using, uh, source material, original source material, almost exclusively from British archives, uh, archives in Virginia from, uh, the 1650s and, uh, archives from Barbados. It details the 60,000 Irish who were sold into slavery um if you're a fan of studio ghibli freaking uh spirited away is based on an irish book about an irish girl who was kidnapped into slavery like (laughs) that's that's what it is 
So yeah, I mean, <laughs> calling it race-based slavery is a little disingenuous, but yeah. but it's close enough. Like let, yeah. let's go with that. Tra- tradi- traditional view. All right. Yeah, it's and that's <laughs> what it is. But it's like that the American flag now, despite having done that. And despite flying over, you know, the capitals of states that were spraying civil rights protesters with fire hoses and over college campuses where National Guard uh, troops shot students that were protesting a war that they didn't want and all of this, despite all that, they will still say, well, it's a, it was designed to be a symbol of freedom. Hasn't, what? Hasn't the U.S. been at war for like all but two or three years of its existence. Yeah, basically the only years it wasn't (laughs) at war was in between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Yeah. Like, that was it. The end, And the end of the Revolutionary War is the 1780s, the late 1780s. So you're looking at, like, 10 years at most, maybe. (laughs) That's it. But yet they say freedom. It's a symbol of freedom because the phrase freedom is apparently just synonymous well, it's, it's, with it's America. A, it's a catchphrase. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> freedom, liberty, constitution, oh, yeah. social, or, uh, uh, um, um, social distancing. It's, it's, they're all they're catchphrases. They're all pr- propaganda. Well, even, right. even my tattoo on my forearm, you know, that says, uh, you know, that that's the, you know, having come take is what translates yeah. to great. Molanabe. Yeah, Molanabe. It, it, the, the idea that, you know, well, if you, you're you coming here to take my weapons, well, then take them. Bring it. I, I dare you. Even that. Yeah, even that has become this catchphrase that doesn't mean what it used to mean. And, of course, <laughs> no. its original meaning was a little different. And the Spartans were actually the bad guys, arguably. But it, it's not important. That's not important. <laughs> speaking of speaking of not important, all right. Uh, let's, since we spent like half the time on that, all right. Um, businesses chafing under the COVID nineteen lockdown turn to armed defiance. Uh, this is a uh, she- um, Shepherd Shepherd Texas. Uh, when Jamie Williams decided to reopen uh, her East Texas tattoo studio last week in defiance of the state's coronavirus restrictions, she asked Philip Archibald for help. He showed up with his dog Zeus, his friends, and an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. Archibald established a armed perimeter in the parking lot outside Cash and Burn Tattoo, secured by five men with military-style rifles, tactical shotguns, camouflage vests, and walkie-talkies. One already had a large tattoo uh, of, of his own. We the people, it said. Quote, I think it should be a business's right if they want to open, if they want, if they want to close or open, said Archibald, a 29-year-old online fitness trainer from the Dallas area who, lightly, who lately has made it his personal mission to help Texas, businesses, Texas business owners challenge government orders to keep their doors shut during the coronavirus pandemic. Quote, what is coming to a or who is what is coming to arrest a person who is opening their business according to their constitutional rights? That's confrontation. Mm-hmm. Call it armed reopening. Uh, when Greg Abbott earlier this month allowed a wide range of malls, restaurants, and other businesses to reopen after coronavirus lockdown, bars, saloons, tattoo parlors, and other enterprises where social distancing is more difficult were ordered to remain closed for a larger period for a longer period. In at least a half dozen cases around the state in recent days, frustrated small business owners have turned to heavily armed militia style protesters um, like Archibald's group to serve as opening as reopening security guards. And they work. Yes. Um, the showy displays of local firepower are creating a dilemma for the authorities who face public demands for enforcement with social distancing guidelines. Uh, but also strong pushback from conservatives in some parts of the states who are convinced that restrictions go too far. You mean like the Supreme Court pointed out here in Wisconsin? Um, <laughs> Wisconsin don't, didn't... Um, North Carolina, they just got ruled unconstitutional either? Yeah, I think... Cause yeah. what And that, that was the significant thing about the Wisconsin ruling is it was the first one, which is why everyone's talking about here... Um, if you're just tuning in to the podcast for the first oh, time, I yeah. live in Wisconsin. Um, the, so that was the, the big thing was that it's, uh, a judicial, it's a judicial precedent. 
And so because of that, now other states are cascading, which is what uh, the largely Democrat governors were so scared of. Because once that happened, now that keeps happening where it gets ruled unconstitutional because it is overstepping their bounds. Yeah. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about blah, 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 blah. And then um, recent days, Archibald has also bought his firearm to the illicit openings of a handful of gyms, bars, and other businesses around the state. Uh, days before the reopening of in Shepherd, uh, Archibald helped organize a protest outside an illegally reopened bar in West Texas City of Odessa. <laughs> Just that, the <sighs> phrase, the phrase illicit openings, making it sound like it's a friggin' haircutting speakeasy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like there's a special knock so that you can go to the salon. <laughs> It's, it's yeah, it's ah, it's so bad. But um yeah, like these I, the the whole point in this article was it's 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 a lot more rhetoric and and all that other stuff, but the reason I brought it up is because these people aren't turning to the police. Right? This is not the the police out there saying Hey, we'll 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 keep you open. It's not the politicians out there saying, "Hey, we'll keep you open." It's not even the county sheriffs who are saying, "Well, I won't restrict it," <laughs> who are also saying, "And I'll help you." Yeah, stay open. No, they're not saying any of that stuff. But it's um, <sighs> um, yeah. So, so some of the protesters say they are merely engaged in marketing, drawing attention to businesses. So that they're reopening attracts more customers, while others say they are part of a grassroots rebellion against the oppressive government. We go out there because we want peace, but we prepare for war, said C.J. Grisham, 46, a retired Army sergeant whose gun rights group Open Carry Texas helped, uh, helped the arrested owner of the bar in Texas get a lawyer. Uh, quote, I hope this never happened, but at some point, guns are going to have to cease to be a show of force and be a response to the force. He's not wrong, but I would argue they already are and have been for a long time. Oh, uh, you know, some of these guys, I mean, some of these oh, guys yeah, have, have the lines are. They're filthy so, flag wavers. So wavy. Yeah. Yeah. They're still they still think. And it's this weird cognitive dissonance thing in the militia movement. And a lot of the right wing uh, pro Second Amendment groups where they simultaneously are stocking up on weapons to. uh try and you know fight the government while worshiping the very agents that they would have to fight that's that's why i left um i was i don't want to say in contact but i was i was working with some people here and um yeah that's why that's why i left that was the whole reason that I didn't join. I, I had um, years ago, quite a few years ago, I had uh, talked to uh, the, the Black Crows. I think that's what they're called. Or the, the Crows, something like that. Um, they're a northern Midwest militia. And just working with them, talking to them, and, and they're still super flag wavy. And still, like, despite going, I need to be this militia so that we can stand up to a tyrannical government. Still, <laughs> we're like, but go police, go military, mm -hmm. come and take it. But I don't understand who's taking it. Like, they were still worshiping that. And it just drove me insane. Like, really? You, you guys don't <laughs> they don't get this? <laughs> like, I, st I still follow, like, they're, they're still on Facebook, the group that I, I had interactions with they're still on facebook under different names and i still follow some of their pages and you'll that's what i'll see i'll see them training they'll throw pic they'll throw pictures of them training with their <laughs> featureless rifles <laughs> <laughs> or, or their, their their rifles with their fixed magazines and they'll have a blue flag patch on their vest oh jesus hey, who the fuck do you think you're gonna fight man yeah 
That's no. exactly it. Like you just you don't get it, do you? You just don't understand <laughs> no. who you're gonna have to be up against. And you'll still see them talk about, oh well, like they're they still honestly believe that cops aren't gonna enforce gun confiscation, even though cops are already enforcing gun confiscation. Every every firearms law on the books that is enforced is backed by confiscation. Yeah. If, you, if you've if you've ever if you've ever heard the term illegal firearm. That is a confiscated firearm. Yep. 80, oh, yeah. 80%, 80% lowers. The confiscated 80% lowers. That is. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. All right. And they'll, they'll, still, they'll still flag wave and they'll still do all that crap. It's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Um, Massachusetts town points or paints arrows on the sidewalk, directing people which way to walk during Corona. <laughs> during... <laughs> Sorry. All right. Massachusetts town paints arrows on sidewalks, directing people which way to walk during COVID-19. As if that'll work. I mean, have you ever been to an airport? There are, <laughs> there are, there are footprints, right? There's, there's, there's these little signs, you know, where, where they have the moving sidewalk and then they have the, so, so you have stand, 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 walk, walk, walk. You have, you have the, the signs at the beginning, stand left or, you know, walk right. You even have footprints apart and together, and you still get people <laughs> on the left handrail. It's fun to fly. So you honestly think? <laughs> it's, all right. Uh, this is a Swamp Scott, Massachusetts. Swamp Scott. Swamp Scott. Township workers in Swamp Scott, Massachusetts, today were seen painting orange arrows on sidewalks in town to be used as a guide to tell which direction people should walk on each side of the street. So they're making one-way sidewalks. They're making one-way sidewalks. It's supposed to be like a, a, with traffic. Oh my but god! Sidewalks, you guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> even oh gosh, work- I want to get to that business even, over there, but the, even, the arrows even, are telling me. Even the workers painting the arrows admit that the idea is pretty stupid, and they really didn't know why they were painting the lines. And yet they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we we. We're well aware of it, the worker said. It's just a suggestion. I don't know. <laughs> oh my goodness! So they're even the people to see in this. And there, I don't know if you, if you can see that there. There's the uh, the picture. There's the arrow <laughs> spray paint. And then, I mean, I just and the funny thing is, those masks are actually useful for what they're doing. Um, but. <laughs> Because of the spray paint that's it's actually keeping. But uh, I just want to point out here that even these people know that what they're doing is stupid and meaningless. They're but st- because they were told to do it, they're still going to do it. They're still going to do it. Just like cops enforcing unconstitutional laws. Yep. Bah. Or, or in this case, um, CPS. In this case, being our next article because I, I I wanted Deer to be here for this one, but she's not, so we're gonna do it without her. As well, this one, this is the I, I posted this one on, on my Facebook earlier, and um, it was nothing but angry reacts. Um, yeah, <sighs> Oregon governor pulls out all stops to destroy mother who reopened her salon. Fucking absolutely <sighs> disgusting, tyrannical bitch in charge of Oregon. Yes, Kate Brown. And I actually I actually said like if you're if you're looking for a reason to boog, and that was that was my commentary on the article, but um Lindsey Graham, not politician Lindsey Graham, it's a female Lindsey Graham. Uh Lindsey Graham opened her Salem saloon or salon last week in defiance of the state lockdown orders. In response, Democratic Governor Kate Brown uh, arranged a fourteen thousand dollar fine through the Occupational Safety and Health Association OSHA, and sent Child Protective Services to visit her kids at home while Graham was at work. So she she opened her business because she needed to take care of her kids and earn money, and the response was to use OSHA to get around the fact that there is no force behind an edict like that. Yeah. She used OSHA to coerce her and threatened to take 
her children. Yes. It, uh, it, it, yeah. Um, it's obvious that Governor Brown has decided to bully Graham and make an example of her and the contractors that work out of her salon. Last Thursday, Oregon OSHA notified Graham they have, they have been classifying the contracting work in her saloon as employees. This is a frontal assault on independent contract work and has no business in statute. OSHA further informed her that they will issue a $14,000 fine for workplace violations. Uh, if allowed to stand, the action would put at risk every beauty, every beauty salon in the state of Oregon that operates with contractors. OSHA then bullied Graham with the threat of notifying other state agencies and initiating additional investigations. Kate Brown has decided to utilize the full weight of the state to target and destroy Lindsey Graham. Brown has even targeted her family and children. Graham received the visit from CPS at her home just three days after she reopened her salon. Yeah, it's, there's a timeline uh, from the 2nd to the 14th. I'm going to read that. Uh, in an interview with PJ Media, Graham said that there was no way OSHA even has jurisdiction over her salon, and her attorney con- and her attorney concurs. Salon owners often lease out stations to stylists classified as independent contractors. Lindsay doesn't actually have any employees and does not operate a workspace. Therefore, OSHA could or OSHA should not have any involvement at all. They've they've appointed themselves arbitrators in the case without any legal authorization. I just it so I mean think about think about this for a minute, and and in light of the Wisconsin North Carolina Supreme Court decisions, process this for a minute. Mm-hmm. So because the governor is aware that her edicts cannot, in fact, stop anyone, hold no actual constitutional weight mm-hmm. to stop anyone from opening their businesses. Her response is to go, well, what other unelected bureaucrats can I use? What other arms of force and intimidation from the government do I have at my disposal? And she found OSHA, who also shouldn't have any jurisdiction at all, (laughs) but don't care and never have uh, to come in. And CPS... More unelected bureaucrats who are basically free to operate as pirates with oh, no actual restriction of law. Uh, CPS CPS is one of the most overpowered government institutions. I just, like, like I think they're even higher up there on that list than the EPA in terms of in terms of power. So. And so her her solution is to find these other agencies to then Mm -hmm. use to intimidate her to try and convince her to comply to which my response is. So all of these people who go, Oh, well not all laws, not all, all regulations are backed by the threat of violence and force. Really? (laughs) Then why (laughs) pray tell? Is that what go to what, what happens if she doesn't pay the $14,000 you guys? They will send police, armed police, to yep. shut her down and confiscate things and possibly imprison her. That's yeah. the thing. It's You can't tell me that this isn't all backed by the threat of murder, violence and murder, mm-hmm. because Everything if is. it wasn't, she wouldn't need to use, she wouldn't even find use in using these unelected bureaucrats yeah. to enforce regulations that yeah. they arbitrarily declared. Yeah, Um Graham also told PJ Media the frightening details of the CPS visit, which occurred while she and her husband were both at work. Quote, I'm not going to point my finger at Kate Brown and say she did it. My attorney just says there is nothing in my file or around my life or in my home to warrant a CPS call. What are the chances a state government official shows up at my home three days after I defy her orders on a completely bogus grounds? Oh, complete coincidence. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, quote, I don't know how the CPS worker didn't just close the case when she walked in the front door. They had a report and it was full of immaculately bogus material, just random material as to why my home was unfit for children. My attorney said that the fact that the case is not closed is another interesting detail. It's still pending. 
Oh yeah, it, CPS. See, that's the thing is CPS will almost never close a file. No, nope. they will once CPS shows up to your house, even if it's a bullshit thing. You have a a vindictive neighbor who calls. They will never close it, and they will yep. always use the fact that you have because as long as there's an open case, uh-huh. they don't need an additional cause to show back up to your house. They nope. can do it any time they want they do not need a warrant because they have an active case yeah uh quote he showed up while he showed up when i was gone at work and we had a babysitter watching the babysitter graham so i quote so i had to wait another day to speak to him he did the whole he did the whole thing he sat me down and interviewed me separate from my husband he interviewed my husband he questioned my six-year-old child he made me take him on a tour of my house he made me lift the toilet seat he checked my baby's diaper Never in my life would I have thought I'd have an experience something like that. That's harassment at the highest level. And for the record, if hypothetically a rebellion, open rebellion happened and you were really after people who were truly the nastiest of the nasty in terms of like Gestapo level enforcement of the state. CPS workers should be at the very top of that list. Oh, damn near to the top. Like it, there are there are thousands and thousands and thousands of horror stories when it comes to CPS. Um ask Lindsay about the Native American children and CPS with mm-hmm. them and and the Canadians and, and the the First Nation people and it's <sighs> Oh yeah, that's, sure. That's 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 a whole episode on itself, but yeah, our our, our friend Cheryl, she's got plenty of stories about uh-huh. that that her grandmother told her about um, in Canada about the uh, the natives being just stolen away because they're mm-hmm. being raised in traditional households, traditional native yep. culture households, and being just stolen away because well, it's unhealthy. There's how many hundred I would argue probably hundreds of thousands if you really investigate it of cases where kids are taken away from perfectly reasonable parents fine parents because of something that the state has just decided it doesn't like and then given to somebody who turns out to be mm-hmm. a child molester oh. or a child trafficker mm-hmm. or they murder the child or neglect the child to the point of their dying or being severely injured or they beat the child that over and over and over again that happens cps is in no conceivable way actually a beneficial agency any mm-hmm. tiny tiny amount of good they may rarely do is wholly negated by um, the majority of harm that they do um cps here in california um i want to say it was Riverside County or Orange County. I'm pretty sure it was Orange County here in California. Uh, three CPS workers. Um, they took a little boy from his home and, or I think, I think they took a little boy from his home and put him into another home and the boy ended up being beat to death. And the CPS workers admittedly lied on their paperwork and then they got off on qualified immunity because they didn't know, or or they 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 according to them they didn't know that line was wrong. Yeah. So anyway, um, then they got a, a timeline of the events. Uh, May second, Lindsay let her clients know that she would be open the saloon or the salon on the fifth. On May fourth, OSHA threatened her with a seventy thousand dollar fine. On May 5th, she reopened the salon in downtown Salem. May 6th, Lindsay received a letter from the city of, of Salem informing her that she was in violation of the office lease contract. The city of Salem owns the building that salon occupies, which that's a whole nother issue. May 7th, Child Protective Services showed up at her home while she was at office or while she was at the office. May 14th, OSHA told Lindsay that they were going to fine her $14,000 and they will notify other state agencies to initiate additional investigations. That just doesn't sound tyrannical to me at all. It absolutely makes, this whole thing makes my blood fucking boil. Like this is, this is one of those points where I have to say very little because if I actually say what I'm thinking, it's I know, I know, brother, I'm there. <laughs> it's just... Oh, oh, <laughs> it's... 
<laughs> what I will say is that the important lesson here is that if you're going to stand armed guard, if you're one of those people who's going to stand armed guard outside of a business that is opening, particularly clearly in Oregon, you also need to have a detachment standing armed guard outside of that person's home. Yeah. I mean, and they need to be just as willing to actually defend that home against the state. Like it's, it's no coincidence. Okay. So the, on the second, she let, she let the clients know that she was going to open her salon on the second, on the fourth, OSHA threatened her with a $70,000 fine. She hadn't even opened. She hadn't even opened yet on the sixth. She relieved, uh, she received a letter from the city. Um, if you're going to receive a, le- a letter from a, from a, a government, it has to be like documented. And it's going to take more than like a fucking day. And then the day after, or the two, sorry, two days after she opens, she opens on the fifth and on the seventh CPS shows up at her house. And then a week after OSHA said, Oh, there's nothing we, or after a week after a week after CPS said, Oh, there's nothing we could do. OSHA says, Oh, here's a $14,000 fine. Come on now. Yep. See, and this is the thing. That's, this is again, this is one of those things where, you know, that, that me and, and like Nick, uh, bring up and stuff a lot when we talk about the boog is is the idea that you don't need to go looking for the <laughs> fight the fight will come to you oh here is a fight that came to a person mm-hmm. however this person is unwilling or unable to defend herself probably well. I, her standard, but she's probably incapable her husband also looks incapable. So they don't they don't have the ability. And that's the other thing too is remember Oregon has gone the way of California as far as its gun its gun laws and things and it's and Washington with all of the universal background checks and all these restrictions. And so if you comply Yeah, neither one of those people looks like they are ready to defend no. themselves to the death against clearly tyrannical agents of the state no No. and don't forget i mean even if these fines get levied don't forget that incident not all that long ago where men showed up to try and repossess a widow's house yes and a bunch of armed veterans stood between her and the state and the state backed down Mm mm-hmm that's a um, that's that's a good story. The um, that's out of uh, where's that out of? It was somewhere out east. I remember that. Uh, I remember I it was in the east of the U.S., but I don't remember where. I want to say Tennessee. I could be wrong. Pennsylvania, maybe. Um. But I mean, that's that's a moment like if you really want to be a hero, you really want to be known forever as a champion of liberty here. If you are in Oregon, here is your opportunity. This woman, her husband and her children need you to stand between them and a psychopathic tyrant. And a bunch of little tyrants, a bunch of little Gestapo agents, more than happy to enforce through any means necessary the edicts of De Fiera. So if you want to be that guy who stands up and is counted for freedom and liberty and these ideas, that's a point where you can go do that right now. They need you. I'm trying to find that article. Um, I know it's it's. I want to say it's called it's called Widow's Homestead or something like that. Yeah, there's there was a sign outside. This is a uh, immune uh-huh. from repossession or something. Yeah. This is a widow's homestead. Uh, blah blah blah. Um, the uh... I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. That's entirely possible. Um, 
There's uh yeah, because there's a widow's exemption and and there's a lot of stuff. Um oh, there's there's the picture right there. We're talking about. Oh, it doesn't want to focus. There it goes. This is exempt property from seizure. This is a widow's homestead. And there are a bunch of uh, World War II. I think they're World War II veterans. They might be World War I veterans. Um, tackling a uh, guy who, uh, I think it was a county sheriff who was showing up to seize the homestead. Yeah. Um, Eliza Wyatt, or Wyatt uh, a widowed Californian farmer with two children, struggled against the odds of the Great Depression. Uh, no, that's not it. That's not the right one. Um, it might be California, the Wyatt family. It's possible. It was in Cal- I just remember that it was that, that, oh. that is the picture that I'm thinking of where yeah. they, a, a bunch of, a bunch of vets who were like, I literally just got done putting my life on the line for what was supposed to be about freedom. And now I come home and you want to do this. Cause she had unpaid ta- property taxes. Like, no, no. And they stood between. Um, there's the uh, that rebellion with all those those corrupt county officials where the World War Two veterans Athens. Like, got in. And yeah, Athens. It ag- actually got into an actual shootout with police and won um, over the, the, the tyranny <laughs> of the local government. They, they broke into the National Guard and got dynamite and started lobbying dynamite at the at the the. Uh, the sheriff's department, the sheriff's, the the county jail, whatever it was, and yeah, and the sheriff's like, whoa, hold on, <laughs> calm down, yeah. wait, 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 <laughs> wait oh my god, wait a minute, wait a minute, you win. <laughs> yeah, so oh. don't think that that armed, you know, that just being there, um, the Bundy Ranch most recently, you know, the Bundy the Bundy Ranch stand up, a bunch of armed men, not even a f- shot needed to be fired, and the government backed down because at the end of the day. You don't even necessarily need to fire your weapon. You just need to make it very, very real to these bureaucrats and these people who right now can just go, well, I'm just doing my job. And you need to make them have to go. But is doing my job actually worth my life? Do I believe enough in what I'm doing to die for what I'm doing? And most of them. The vast majority will say no, this is not worth it, and they will leave. It's it's that's the same thing with the with the protesters in Michigan going into the into the into the um going into the into the state office or mm-hmm. the, whatever it's fucking called up there. And the the politicians wearing body armor. Like things don't change until you force them to change, especially when it comes to government. Like a politician that's not afraid of repercussions for their actions will never change their actions. Oh, anyway. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government yeah. fears the people, there can be freedom. And right now, your governments don't fear you at no. all. And the irony is that you have a lot of these state worshipers, a lot of these bootlickers, and most of them, ironically, right now, are actually from the political left, who also go, I don't worship the state, because er, 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 I'm an idiot, and I don't understand. Um, they, you have a lot of them right now. For educational purposes now. only. For yeah. educational purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of them who, right now, will sit there and argue that, well, you shouldn't be, I mean, these people are just doing this for intimidation. And this is, I mean, we laughed about, was that last, last time that we laughed about that? Yeah. The, the, the article they result in state beatings and or incarceration. Yes. Don't, don't try this at home. Yeah, um, don't try this at home. <laughs> for legal reasons, <laughs> I have to advise you not to actually do this. But in, in, uh, in Minecraft, <laughs> yes, is, exactly. isn't that what the, what the cool kids are saying these days? Yeah, they're in Minecraft. Um, but you so what you're seeing is you, a lot of these leftists and things that are and, and state worshipers on both sides of the fence who are going, well, how dare you intimidate your lawmakers with weapons? That is literally the reason that the Second Amendment exists. 
<laughs> is to intimidate politicians with weapons. When it, when a, what is it? What is it? What's the line? When a long train of abusers or usurpers? A long train yes. of usurpers? Well, there's there's the wonderful quote from uh, the opening of Thomas Paine's um, Common Sense, where, uh, which if you're unfamiliar with, if you don't remember history class uh, <laughs> in the U.S., you get taught was one of the kind of the inspirational documents for the American Revolution. Um, he says in the preamble to, I think it's the 10th edition of Common Sense, he says... Uh, a long habit or too long a habit of thinking a thing not wrong gives it the superficial appearance of it being right. Yes. When you just deal with something and go, well, I mean, maybe it's not wrong. This is um, too long. Uh, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. And raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom, but that turbulence soon soon subsides. Soon soon subsides. Time making more converts than reason. And boy, is that appropriate right now. Like yes. that's I I had initially because I had picked up that copy a long time ago, and I I just shared my memory of it um, the other day on Facebook where I had yeah. quoted it. Um, because it's, it's super, super appropriate right now where right now we're still getting those cries of, but custom, but this yeah. is the way we do things. This is what ignoring do what was, whether or what was, not it's right. What was that tweet? Um, after the, the protest was broken on the, on Michigan state house, oh. there was a tweet like, this is not what we do in America. Yeah. This is not what we do in America. And everyone who knows anything about America is like that. That's, <laughs> that's literally, literally what we do in America. <laughs> that's exactly how America was formed in the first place. So, yep. All right. I got this, another article. Um, it's, it's, it's another, it's from the Washington examiner. It's kind of a lengthy piece. Um, I think we have time. But it's uh it's about a lady that uh, wrote a few bad checks, and how less than three hundred dollars in bad checks turned into a twenty year affair with the state. So, yeah, Tammy Williams, a working mother of five, paid by check when she needed groceries and household supplies in nineteen ninety seven. Unfortunately, her bank account ran low on funds. Four of her checks bounced at a store near her home in Sherwood, near Little Rock, Arkansas. Penalties can be stiff for heirs, especially for shoppers who lack overdraft protection. But what happened to Williams went far beyond bank fees. For the next two decades, police and prosecutors maintained a steady campaign of harassment against her with help of the Sherwood City Court. The pile-on included multiple arrests, fines, and incarcerations. On one occasion, officers took Williams into custody on her daughter's birthday. Another time, they showed up at her workplace and threatened to remove her if she could not pay two hundred dollars cash on the spot. What? That's how one, is that different than the mob? <laughs> one holiday season, they put her behind bars and kept her locked up for thirty days until her husband sold the couple's interest in a family home to cover the city's $2,500 cash demand. Remember, the checks totaled less than $300. And they wanted $2,500 at minimum. Yes. Sherwood officials did not care that the four bad checks had totaled less than $300. Using Williams' inability to pay as leverage, they tacked on additional warrants and fines until her cost topped $5,000. Jesus, you don't have money. Let me go ahead and demand even more. How is this not loan sharking? It gets even like, worse. It gets even worse. Victims trapped in the never ending cycle of court proceedings eventually sued to stop the abuse, triggering a settlement and a promise of reform in 2016. Uh, that victory provided a degree of relief, but the city refused to provide compensation for the years of suffering it had caused. Rather than accept the government's lack of accountability, Williams filed a second lawsuit, this time in federal court, to recover damages. After losing at the court trial level, Williams took her case to the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis. Three judges heard her arguments and acknowledged that abuse had occurred. But the panel ruled on January 28th 
that cities cannot be held liable for unconstitutional actions that perform through municipal courts. I have uh, a an amendment to the <laughs> Bill of Rights that says otherwise. <laughs> Hold on, let me read that again. The judges heard arguments and acknowledged that the abuse had occurred, but the panel ruled on January 28th that cities cannot be held liable for the unconstitutional actions they perform through municipal courts. So they... Cities cannot be held liable for unconstitutional actions they perform perform through municipal courts. So they can do anything they want, and all that they can be held liable to do is go, oops, oops, my bad. I, that's not even a standard for small children. I just yep. man, I'll 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 be right back. Give me a second here. Yeah, I cannot be held liable for unconstitutional actions they perform through municipal courts. Um, the twenty-year struggle highlights a nationwide problem with municipal courts. Unlike higher courts at the county and state level, local operations have a direct financial interest in judicial outcomes. Many cities and towns grow dependent on the revenue and look for ways to expand it, especially during times of economic stress. As sales tax revenue and other resources of municipal income dry up during the coronavirus pandemic, the result in communities will be a surge in traffic, parking, and misdemeanor enforcement. Thousands of people such as Williams will be caught in municipal court systems focused on fines and fees. The result is a type of government abuse called taxation by citation which occurs when cities and towns use code enforcement to raise revenue rather than solely protect the public. New Institute for Justice report measures the risk in all 50 states. The first of its kind analysis published April 30th examines dozens of legal factors to rank states according to how likely their laws are to enable and even encourage taxation by citation. Georgia scored worst in the report, while North Carolina scored the best. Arkansas actually performs well in the survey due to reform started in 2011. Yeah, so this lady was absolutely fucked, but it's not unique to what she does. I mean, it's... um, the, I mean, just the, for me, the whole thing that they can't be held accountable. I debate that. <laughs> it, it gets. I, I'll, I'll read. I'll reread it. I'll read it. Uh, I'll read. Read uh, a paragraph. It's um, <sighs> many cities and many cities and towns grow dependent on the revenue, and look for ways to expand it, especially during periods of economic stress. As sales tax revenue and other resources of municipal income dry up during the coronavirus pandemic, the results in many communities will be a surge in traffic, parking, and misdemeanor enforcement. Thousands of people, such as Williams, will be caught in municipal court systems, uh, municipal court systems focused on fines and fees. The result is a type of government abuse called taxation by citation, which occurs when cities and towns use code enforcement to raise revenue rather than solely to protect the public. Oh, yeah, well, I guess that's so different than usual, but... Uh, <laughs> no, they would never. And it's... So what... I mean, literally what this is, is extortion. Blatant, mafia-level extortion. Yeah. Because I mean, th- that's the only difference between the government and mafia, remember, is that the, yeah. the mafia actually turns a profit. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, the article goes on to talk about uh, Institute of Justice uh, ranked all 50 states in regards to what they do, uh, or regards to this uh, taxation by citation. Uh, Georgia scored the worst. North Carolina scored the best. Oh, yeah. Um, the, when, I, when I lived in Georgia, everyone always laughed that it was, you know, Georgia, come on vacation, stay because you're on probation. 
Um, and that's and that's the way they work. If you in Georgia, you can wind up with a year of probation for driving your car on the road without insurance. A year of probation and you have to pay all the fees accompanying that. So if you can't yeah. afford insurance for your car. You then get extorted even further by the state. If you get caught in Georgia with even tiny amounts of marijuana, they will arrest you, throw you in jail, extort you for bond, and then extort you for a couple of years of probation, extort you for all court fees, everything. That's the way Georgia works. Like, I freaking yeah, despise it's, um, that state. Uh, Georgetown, a village in rural Louisiana, pulls in more than 90% of its revenue from court fines and fees. Several Oklahoma communities top 70%. Uh, addicted to fines, a report from governing.com identifies 80 municipalities nationwide that received more than a half of their income from fines and fees in 2018. And consider consider what the expenditures of the average municipality, I mean, even a small municipality are. It's, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, easily, easily. And more than half of that is coming from literal extortion of people in that community because they can't find any subtle ways to take money from people. They have to extort them blatantly. Yeah. It's just, I, and, and people are like so many, and remember that the only reason that they have the power to do that is because they have cops. They have armed men willing to kill you or throw you in a cell if yeah, you li don't li literally, literally, pay the when, money. Not, not, not only that, but like their jobs literally depend on them getting this money for the local municipality in order to pay the police department. Yep. If that's, if that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know how to define it. And again, how does that make the cops not a criminal organization? Because remember, if you're a member of the mob... All of your money is coming from doing these extortive rackets, mm -hmm. doing all of these things, intimidating people, convincing them to pay you at gunpoint. This is what you do in order to get yourself paid. And if no one pays you because they're not intimidated <laughs> by you, then you don't make money. But it's How it's totally is... it's totally not organized crime, you guys. Yeah, but no, it's definitely no. not organized crime. No, it's you know what it reminds me of is it reminds me of Nixon when of he got interviewed by Robert of, Frost. Of organized crime. <laughs> well, yeah, but when he when when Nixon got interviewed by Robert Frost and Frost was like, "Well, you broke and entered. How is that not illegal?" And he went, "Well, it's not illegal when the president does it." <laughs> I am not a crook. Yeah, I am not a crook. Like yeah. that. How is that not? The same, I mean, it's organized <laughs> crime. It's just blatantly organized crime. It's extortion by the ruling gang. The fact that it's not a lesser gang uh -huh. is meaningless. It's just the ruling gang. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter if there are 100,000 people doing this thing yeah, or if, five. If, if the Bloods or Crips had badges, it's, there's no difference. Exactly. And that's the thing. And you'll notice that the state is when you talk about like getting rid of government because it's organized crime, running, they go, well, what about all, all these gangs will just take over and then they'll they'll be robbing people at gunpoint. You know, they'll, they'll charge them for protection and that's extortion. And that's different than the police because. Exactly. All right. <laughs> uh, we're, we're running short on time, but it wouldn't be a NRK Monk Friends episode if we didn't talk about strippers. Um, <laughs> Pole dancing and hand sanitizer. Wyoming strip club reopens with mask on, close off party. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. It says uh, all um, talks about this girl. Uh, Chloe counts out the crumpled bills, straightening the bills into a stack. She stacks them neatly on her bare leg. <laughs> Twenty-two dollars. The twenty-three-year-old claims not not too bad. All around her, more than a dozen nearly naked women are dancing on the stage and swinging from a brass pole to mu as music thumps and customers shower the dancers with money. It's like any other night in a rural strip club on the Colorado-Wyoming border, with one exception. While the dancers are all wearing barely their outfits, every one of them is wearing a mask. 
<laughs> some are bandanas, some are surgical masks. One looks like a, as if it's swiped from a construction site. There's is the, the there is one of the no shirt, no shoes, no service. Well, they didn't say anything about pants. Yeah, like it's, they only said I need to wear masks. <laughs> yeah, there. Let's see. Uh, some are bandanas, some are surgical masks. One looks li- as if it's swiped from a construction site. There is seemingly odd accessory for women wearing a mix of g-strings, bikinis, and lingerie. <laughs> seemingly odd. Yeah. But this is but this is the time of coronavirus, and following state rules, the women are wearing them as as they fill out their first night back in business. For Cleo, twenty or for Cleo, that twenty two dollars is the first income she's earned in weeks, and she's ready to make more, even if it brings her far closer to customers than the state's six foot social distancing guidelines. <laughs> yeah, just maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Quote: I feel like my makeup is sweating off under this thing. She adds from behind her bandana that looks as, that looks and then looks up as the music changed. Oh, that's my song. Gotta go. <laughs> and the article just goes on to talk about um, uh, the Den, one of the first strip clubs in the country to reopen amid the coronavirus pandemic to celebrate its grand opening. The strip club through a masks on close off party. I mean, yeah. I, you yeah, know, because, the... yeah, because Wyoming has so few coronavirus cases, state uh, health officials on Friday allowed most businesses to reopen, including sit down restaurants and bars, which is how the DIN is licensed. Likely due to its large size and small population, Wyoming has had few coronavirus cases. Officials say they confirmed 541 cases with just another 175 listed as positive and only seven deaths. So, it, so I mean, <laughs> You want to talk about absurdity. In order to comply with the law, they have to look like they're about to rob a train, but they're allowed to look like they're about to rob a train in nothing but a G-string. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of comical. It really is kind of comical. There's the there's the the group picture of the girls. Your camera really doesn't want to focus on anything. That's uh, uh, can we? Uh, there it goes. Yeah, it's it's just it's comical. I I find it. I think it's hilarious. But and there's another one that says, uh, "I'm super excited. I'm a little nervous because the virus is still out there, but I'm glad to be able to work because a lot of people can't yet." Says dancer Doris Craig, twenty, between performances. "Quote: The stimulus money was nice, but that's going to run out, and I don't like to feel like I'm dependent on the government." What's a very Wyoming attitude? Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, you live in Wyoming. The the government realistically has a very very tiny impact on your day to day life. Uh, it's because there's right. nobody around. <laughs> right. No, no building, no building permits needed if it's under two story, which is why a lot of them have split homes. And then um, the county where my friend Sarah and Tyson live, they have two sheriffs in the whole county. And That's they have a, and they have a city named Wyoming or a, a city named Freedom in their county. So, so. yeah. Because there's, there's nothing there. I mean, there's a reason why so many people who really love freedom and value freedom move to, like, South Dakota or <laughs> North Dakota My, or Wyoming. The, the state of Wyoming has half as many people in it as my county. The entire state. The state of Wyoming has half as many people as my county. Yeah. So, like, consider, I mean, what that, that means. I mean... So if you have like almost no police, you have almost no government, no regulation because there's nobody there. Um, you are living very, but, very close to the way. The, but on, on the flip side, Sarah and Tyson, they still have snow on the ground. So <laughs> well, I didn't say there weren't trade offs, <laughs> but is, if freedom is worth dying for, freedom is worth having to shovel nine months out of the year for. Like it just, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying like that's, if, that's, that's why people invented greenhouses. Exactly. You can have greenhouses. I've always thought it would be interesting to like build like a dome house, like greenhouse where it's a all ge- glass. A desk dome. Yeah. And like, just have it all glass so that it's bringing uh-huh. in all the sunlight all the, all year yeah, and like have some um, sort of heater. And then that way you can live in a tropical paradise mm-hmm. in there's the middle a, of the mountains of Wyoming. There's, there's, 
there's a famous house. I want to say it's in Sweden, and it's 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 a large, good size house, right? Like a, like a, a modern size house, and over the top of it is a greenhouse, and the greenhouse insulates the regular house because yep. it's yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's what so, I'd want because then you can have a lawn. Like, and you can do, you can go out like year round. Yeah. It doesn't matter that it's 20 below outside. It's 70 degrees in here. <laughs> so I can so. just go out and go do things and who cares? Yeah. All right. Um, we're at two hours. We got like 20 seconds left before that's up. So, okay. So if you guys want, um, if you haven't been noticing the patch on my hat, it is from Poppins patches. It is a, a plague doctor. It says work hard, plague hard. He's holding, uh, a uh, bottle of Corona. A uh, he's got the toilet paper there. I think that his wand's actually got a lime on it. Um, but he's got that on it. I I'm wearing one. I have one to give away. If you guys want to be entered in the giveaway, if you made it to the end of the podcast and you want to actually be entered to get this thing for free for you, um, courtesy of us and Poppins Patches, you uh, have to make sure that you like our page. Um, Anarchy Among Friends Roundtable Discussion on Facebook. Make sure that you like Poppins Patches on Facebook. Um, share this podcast that we're going to be posting on Facebook with your friends, and you'll be entered, and we'll give it, what, say a week till next till our next episode, and sure. we'll pick a winner, um, announce the winner. when Once we announce um, it, we'll get a hold of you, get your shipping information, and I will send you this brand new share, patch. You have to share it from the Facebook page so that Yes, and it has to be, it has to be public so that we can see it. Yep, we got to be able to see it because if you guys share it and you have it as a private post, I I can't see it, so I don't know that you did it. So you won't be entered. You got to share it. Uh, make sure that you like the post as well. So like the post, share the post, like the page, it will, share or like Poppins Patches page as well. And yeah, then it you're it will be it will be the pinned post at the top of the Anarchy Among Friends Drops of Discussion Facebook page. Um, additionally, you can f- also find links to Dirica's book and Andrew's Facebook page, uh, Inked Anarchist Hootenanny Roundup, and we'll also link Poppins patches for you, so you don't yep. have to go through the excruciated effort of, of searching look, it. of searching it for yourself. Yep, and we're also on Hootenanny Roundup too. Yes. We're giving away a Muy Caliente uh, flamethrower patch with a nice little sombrero on it. It's a World War II era. American flamethrower. Um, we're also giving that one away. Same rules on that post. You can find that on Inked Anarchy, Inked Anarchist Hootenanny Roundups Facebook page yes. as well. If you want to get entered in that one, similar rules, read the post for the rules on that one. Yes. Um, links are in the description below. This has been episode 93. Thanks for hanging out. We'll catch you next time. Peace. Yep.